My name is Robert Elswit, and you're listening to the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ben. Good evening, Ilya. How are you doing? I am just dandy. How about you? I am extra swell. <laughs> extra swell. You look extra swell. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. It's mostly my camo studio video uh, feed for my Zoom situation here. It totally is. Hey, we ought to give a quick shout out to our friends at Assemble.tv. And oh, uh, they're, they're still time. running that uh, special. So if you want to get a free month. So that means if you've got a project and you'd like to use like an online production management tool that can keep everything organized, uh, you can enter the promo code CINEPOD, C-I-N-E-P-O-D, and check out and you will get a month free. So, hey, a free month of uh, playing with some great, uh, you know, cloud-based software. You are underselling software. it, Ilya. It is an I, online production binder and it has everything that you ever need to show or share or keep or, or I, collaborate I was, with. I was underselling it. I know I was underselling it, but yeah. you know, I've, I've tried, I've tried the, the heavy sale and I, I don't know how many people uh, were listening to it. So I figured I'd just like ease off on the, you know, really? pump the brakes well, a little. I'm, so I'm just going to pump the gas here and just <laughs> okay. say, I, if you have a, if you have a project that's gearing up, absolutely try this out for a month for free. I don't think you'll be disappointed. It's uh, one of the best platforms I've ever seen for uh, gathering assets, sharing assets, creating uh, a calendar. Their calendar, I want every calendar to be like their calendar. Their calendar and, is brilliant. And you don't have to take our word for it. If you go to our YouTube channel for the Cinematography Podcast, there is a cool video there that kind of does a walkthrough in a few minutes, yep. uh, Yeah, which which is great. And you can you can see exactly how it works. So no, it's, it's great stuff. Check it out. Assemble.tv, promo code Cinepod. So Ben, who is on the show today? Well, who would you like most to be on the show? Uh, well, I know the answer to this question. It's a rhetorical question, but it is exactly the person who I would like most to be on the show right now, which is Robert Elswit. Holy crap, Robert Elswit. And I feel like we need to almost apologize in advance when we get the opportunity to interview somebody with a breadth of career of somebody like Robert Elswit, who, if you are not familiar with him, you've definitely seen What's his work. What's wrong with you? Yeah, for real. <laughs> And he said he would actually come back because he shot the new movie, King Richard, about the father of Serena and Venus Williams, starring Will Smith. Gorgeous film. Amazing film. Uh, it's on HBO Max right now, also in theaters. Please check it out. And he was there to talk about that. We, we touched on a lot of his other work, but I feel like we just we didn't have enough time to get into the the nut meat of, you know, Boogie Nights, Magnolia. All the work he's done with David Mamet, he is a living legend and we were lucky to have him on the show. And so I, I'm hoping we can really get him back. I'm glad we got to talk to him. I really look forward to doing it again. Uh, I know that our producer, Alana, is setting that up as we speak to make that happen sometime in the new year. And uh, we will get into the nitty gritty of all the good stuff, the old stuff, the stuff that we didn't get to get into as much as we would have liked to. So it'll, mm. it'll be fun. Excellent. And so what would you like to discuss for our close focus today? Ilya, this was your topic. Oh, well, um, I think it's interesting because uh, you hear a lot in the media, you hear a lot out there about the global supply chain and the backlogs and the backups that are happening right now and how difficult it is to get certain things into this country. And there was a chip shortage and all kinds of other things. But uh, I don't think that too many people have been talking about how it directly affects motion picture, television, uh, cinematography, and, mm. and that is that a lot of the electronics that goes into the cameras in particular, but also lights and other major bits of infrastructure for this industry is assembled in multiple countries or assembled, uh, manufactured in multiple places. And uh, with the giant backlog of ships that are, are parked out into the Pacific Ocean of uh, the, the harbor at San Pedro right now, there's a lot of stuff not making it into the country. Now, it has gotten significantly better. It went from about 86 container ships out there down to about 30 now, it sounds like. But still, like uh, some uh, brands have had a, have been really hurt by this. One of them, our sponsor, Aperture. Aperture has had a really hard time getting stuff up until very recently. 
And now, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, suddenly we have been flooded. I think everyone, everyone in the U.S. has been flooded with the product that uh, Aperture had sitting out there in those container ships. So, like, right now at Hot Ride Cameras, we just unboxed a day where we had 92 items arrive from Aperture. Then the next day we had 55 items arrive from Aperture. And then I want to say it was like 103 items or something like that. But, wow. like, all week, it's like, where do we put everything? So uh, we've gotten very creative. And I have to say that if you were looking for one of the most sought after items uh, that Aperture makes, which was the F10 Fresnel and Barn Doors, we've been getting creative in our stacking of them and have been shaping, uh, you know, Christmas trees in our showroom of boxes. You know, we're making like, we feel like if you remember those, uh, you know, going into the grocery store and you'd see those can displays that were very, these very elaborate, you know, cans stacked on top of each other. We're doing that with expensive lighting equipment now. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. but, uh, but you know, it's, it's also true. So uh, Aperture, they're fine people. They were really hit hard by this uh, supply chain but uh, they also have been extremely busy and we have also been extremely busy with them if you are looking for aperture products there's a fantastically good chance that they are in stock at, at hot red right now and i'll tell you that canon also super hit hard by all this yeah they, canon, they announced uh, they're delaying one of their cameras uh they're saying it might be delayed by six months their flagship camera, yeah, uh, and yeah the R3, which uh, which there was a lot of fanfare around this camera. It's like you know, it's their yeah. it's their bad mamma jamma. It's like their answer to Sony's A1. It's their answer to you know Nikon Z9. It's like this is a, a big, huge, important release for them, and. It was only released in in Japan in Japanese, but if you translate the press release, which we can put a link to in the in the show notes, there's a, a pretty sincere apology about like if you didn't order it already, if you're not already working with a dealer, it might be six months from now, which is Oof. painful, really, really painful. If you have been waiting patiently for the latest, greatest mirrorless Canon camera to then have it uh, delayed like that, thankfully we we already have uh, received some at Hot Rod, which is which was great. But yeah, it's a it's an interesting time even when things improve it's still it's still not great and um i know that companies like well Sony, i mean you know yeah. the, the the basic problem is that all of society got shut down for over a year not just america but around the world as covid ravaged all of us and then when we started to be able to it's not that the pandemic is over but it's that we understand how to conduct business safely better now as we wind down this pandemic hopefully you know it's like you can't just put your foot on the gas and say hey open commerce is back up again it, you can't just hit a dip switch and turn it back the way it was you know there's a great episode of mythbusters where uh they actually prove that you cannot hit the ground running which i thought was rude was they they were like yeah, really? this is expression called hit the ground running and then so they did uh, various things and they're like no you, you you just can't do it so yeah they tried to like drop cars with the wheels already spinning and turns out that they don't get going faster than if they actually just hit the ground and then yeah. gradually accelerate so you know it's i miss the mythbusters yeah, a lot yeah, that was a great that show. was a fun one anyway so ben i think it's about time that we get to our interview with robert ellswood here we go <laughs> The Cinematography Podcast Interview. It's a cliche when a host introduces a guest and you hear, our next guest needs no introduction, right before they give a very lengthy introduction. Now, they do this because a lot of their audience is not actually up to speed on who's on the show, but our guest truly needs no introduction, so instead, I'm just going to do a quick rundown of his body of work. Hand That Rocks the Cradle, Boogie Nights, 8mm, Magnolia, Good Night and Good Luck, there Will Be Blood, for which he won the Oscar for Best Cinematography, Red Belt, The Town, a host of spy thrillers, including a James Bond movie, Tomorrow Never Dies, two Mission Impossibles, uh, Ghost Protocol and Rogue Nation, The Bourne Legacy, and a uh, personal favorite of mine, Nightcrawler, and most recently, King Richard, which is currently available on HBO. Robert Ellswit, thank you so much for being on the Cinematography Podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You left out Return of the Living Dead Part 2. That was what oh. I was about to interrupt him and say, you're forgetting the most important movie, yeah. Return of the Living Dead Part 2. And I also want to talk about The Sure Thing. Yeah, The Sure Thing. <laughs> Any, anyone who listens to the podcast knows that I'm a giant horror fan, and I saw Return of the Living Dead Part 2 in the theater. I love that Whoa. movie. Whoa! It's, yeah. it's a kind of a wonderful movie. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. 
I always like whenever we're going to interview somebody, if I scroll down to the beginning of somebody's career, I'll often see like one of my all time favorite movies just <laughs> lurking around in their early years. And uh, right. it, it was I was so excited to see that you had done that in addition to every other movie that Ilya just listed, which is like a murderer's <laughs> row of amazing films. Uh, you, you know, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's sort of a trend, actually, when we when we scroll back through the IMDb's of, of our guests. Uh, really? Typically, yes, there's uh, there's horror films. Corman mm. films or a Red, Red Shoe, Shoe Diaries. Diaries. Yeah. <laughs> Red Shoe Diaries. Yeah, the other one is. is that true? Red it's Red true. Diaries. We've talked to so wow. many people. Yes. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's the thing shocking. about Red Shoe Diaries, they really cared about what they looked like. I remember watching a few of them. And uh, yeah, it seemed like a great thing for cinematographers to do back then. Whatever that was. When was it? It, it was like yeah. 25 years ago, I think. 20, wow. 25 years ago. It was like the it was like the beginning of like soft core video, right? It was. It like, was yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. 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 Late night oh. Showtime HBO. Uh, Sadly, yeah. I was never asked to do Red Shoe <laughs> Diaries. I have to say. Well, Honestly. you and Roberto um, Schaefer both both di- uh, he did it, you didn't, but you both ended up making Bond movies. So. Well, <laughs> Roberto, I can't even imagine doing Red Shoe Diaries, but maybe he did. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so we should talk about King Richard because King Richard okay. is, of course, uh, your latest project that's out and about, and people can watch it on HBO Max, and uh, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a it's a it's a beautiful mm-hmm. movie, and and we'll dive right into it. Tell us about the research that you went into because you know I will say that I've seen movies about tennis, and there is I've never seen a tennis movie that looks like King Richard. So uh, well, and I would actually say mean? it's in in what way? Because mm. we looked at every tennis movie. We did Warner Brothers in their, in their great generosity sent us to the U.S. Open in New York two years ago, I guess it was the year before we started shooting, to watch professional tennis because neither Ray or myself had actually seen it up close. Watch it on TV, it isn't the same. Sitting in a stadium, watching those athletes hit the ball as hard as they do, run as fast as they do, is an extraordinary experience. And we were in the box right next to the Williams family and we watched uh, lots of matches and we watched Serena. And we were trying to figure out, because neither has ever really played tennis, although I'd taken lessons and hit the ball a few times and played with various people over the years. I never really was a tennis player. So we wanted to figure out what to do and how to do it. And the producers of this movie, the White Brothers, were very, very concerned about having the tennis be realistic in a way that none of them felt had been kind of done correctly before, that the speed and athleticism of tennis players had not really been in evidence in other tennis movies. And we watched them all. We watched all the things that were made recently. And they all had different approaches, but they were, you know, you're always dealing with actors pretending to be tennis players. And it's a tricky thing to do. What do you do when they really can't run as fast as they need to, hit the ball as hard? Um, be as athletic as they really need to be to believe you're at the top end of professional tennis. And the story we were telling was really about two girls who were trying to learn how to, not learn how to play tennis, but develop their tennis skills. So a lot of our tennis footage was practice. It was working out with the two coaches that we see in the movie and their mother and their father, of course, learning to play or learning to approach the game in a certain way and how it changed them and how they developed. The matches they play or the matches that actually Venus plays are all juniors matches initially. And they were very, very carefully, or at least we were able to carefully design them around scripted beats that told the story of how she dominated juniors during the period of time, the one year period of time when she played. And also a very important part of the story was Richard's reaction to the way that the parents of the other players interacted with their kids, which was kind of all kind of storytelling beats. Like how does Venus, or rather, how does Venus clock these girls? How does she beat them beat by beat by beat all the way through? So we designed specific moments designed to show someone losing, someone losing to Venus in a very specific way, and usually also the reaction of mom or dad to what that moment was, and also the little kids. And we were going to tell the story without doing what was done in Wimbledon and Borg McEnroe and in the movie with Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King. We were not going to have a play-by-play announcer tell us what was going on. We weren't going to meet people we'd never seen before, as in Wimbledon, when John McEnroe shows up and describe the significance of every single point or talk about women's tennis and how Venus has completely revolutionized it or anything. 
We were simply going to watch them play and we were going to understand what was going on in terms of the score and also in terms of what was happening between them emotionally, between Venus and her family and her father, by their performance. And that was something Ray felt, you know, we both felt very, we wanted to do that. So how you do that um, involved a lot of sort of careful thinking about how to shoot the match and how to shoot the performance and also how to shoot the match so that our Venus, who is left-handed, Sanaya is left-handed. She had to learn how to, she never played tennis before. She had to learn how to look like a tennis player with a right hand, which she'd never done before. And how we could shoot her so that in juniors, she looked like a, she was at a certain level. And after the instructions through Goldwyn and through Barenthal, she ends up at 15, being at the level that she could play professionally. So it was a combination of, you know, sleight of hand, a little bit of digital work, a little bit of, you know, being behind certain things, but designing the sequence so that the tennis played and it was as interesting and as believable as it could be in terms of speed and athleticism, but also the emotional moments that were going on with the actor, with Venus and with Sanchez Vicario and with Stafford were understandable. You didn't have to know the score. You just had to know what was going on emotionally. And you, from that, you would understand who was ahead, who was behind, and what was at stake, and where they were in the match. I will say that the movie's really kind of got three sort of real uh, geographical spaces. You've got the Southern California Compton sort of segment of the movie. You've got the Florida section of the movie. And then you have the sort of uh, finale Bank of the West, Oakland, you know, right. Bank of the West classic sort of. Right. Like, yeah. Did you approach modifying your look a little bit for each of these, oh, yeah. the, each of these places? Because it really comes through in the movie. We're, we're I, I just didn't want to. We're, we're, yeah. we're able to do that. I mean, Compton had to feel a certain way. You know, that period of time, Compton has changed so dramatically. And creating a realistic version of Compton from that era was a, a kind of complicated and a lot of work. And um, we felt it was still a sunny day in L.A. And using filters, which I rarely do digitally, I think was something we thought, you know, after doing a little bit of testing and thinking about it, uh, we tried to do. We, we just diffused the light a little bit. We made highlights skip. We did that sort of without hopefully calling too much attention to it. We made, when it was the sunny days, we had that sort of highlight filtration that makes you aware of the fact that it bounces off surfaces and skips across the floor and the buildings. And it just isn't as sharp and as clinical looking as everybody, as digital is out of the box, essentially. And I did so you that did, probably- you did that, in, you did that in post? That was I did a that post in, effect? No, we did it while we were shooting. And I did it probably more than I'd done in any other movie up to then that was digital. We used a lot more filters. I used a lot more filters. They used the black, uh, Promis and Blackness and the kinds of things that kind of diffuse the light and also tend to, uh, they cut the sharpness, the sort of industrial clinical look sometimes that you get automatically if you're shooting with digital equipment. It just diffuses the image slightly. And we did that a lot. We did it all through the Compton stuff. And we didn't do it quite so much when we got to Florida. Florida was a little harsher. We stay, I stayed away from diffusion. I kept it really, tried to organize it, which we were able to do because of timing and everything else, a little more around time of day. So late afternoon sun, feeling the sun more. Whereas in the Compton part of it, even if we had an overcast day, by using diffusion, I sort of softened the image a little bit. You know, kind of how do you create a period look for a period film? I have no idea. But we had all this footage that Richard had engineered various local TV stations over the years when the girls were growing up to shoot. And he'd also shot his own videos, which are we, we had copies of, of the girls, of the kinds of things that are actually in the movie, where he would show to various people and say, these are my two girls, aren't they wonderful? Where he was trying to get a coach at the beginning of the movie. All that stuff exists, and we were able to look at it. Uh, we found a great house, which was a little nicer than the house that they actually lived in. Isha took us to the actual house that the Williams family grew up in, which you can't believe they lived in. It was a box. It was a five-room box. And you can't believe that five girls lived in a room smaller than most people's uh, wardrobe closet. They mm -hmm. all lived there. And that the seven people shared that house, one bathroom, a tiny little kitchen. And we couldn't even shoot the movie in a house that small, even if we built it on a stage. And we ended up finding something that was a little more interesting architecturally. 
It had the kinds of built-in cabinets and stuff like that in the kitchen and dining room and stuff that their house didn't have. Mm -hmm. So we had that. That What that did, I think, was in a wonderful way, was it set them up as a family apart. It made you believe that, given all their circumstances, that they both worked full-time jobs, that they worked, that Orosine and Richard, one would work, one would work out with the girls, one would go play tennis, the other would work, that that organ that that's how they live their lives to focus those girls not just venus and serena but the rest of them that was hard to do and the house said that the neighborhood said that um i think that was one of the most complicated things about the movie was finding the right place to set it and also finding a way of telling the story about those kids that focused on the family when I think about your work, a lot of times I think about nobody, in my opinion, before I even moved to L.A., had put in my head what L.A. was like as a wow. cinematographer. Uh, there's a documentary called Los Angeles Plays Itself. Oh, uh, I feel like you get that. Like, I feel like when, when I watch your films that are set in L.A., they really feel like L.A. feels like Compton. Your Compton feels like Compton. It doesn't feel like it's trying to be something that I would have imagined as Compton from watching Boys in the Hood. It doesn't feel like anything else. Nightcrawler to me is just is what the valley is like at night. It, it's what L.A. is like at night. You know, it, it all goes out of script. And I have to say, it goes out of script and directing. It's not me. You know, Nightcrawler was really unique because Danny, Danny Gilroy wrote it and directed it. had a really unique idea about the ribbons of freeways that run through the valley and that L.A. becomes, and it, uh, certainly because of the character and the nature of the story, that it's about, look at all this connective tissue that puts this really weird, disparate areas of Los Angeles together. It's these freeways. It's horrible fucking freeways. It's wind all the way. <laughs> and that there really was, and he was really interested in creating this sense of there's this stuff in the valley, and then there's this giant hill, which you have to go over to get to Hollywood and to the rest of L.A., and that there's a difference between the two and that they look different and feel different and sitting in a car, we'll blue screen, we'll shoot plates later and stuff like that. And it's just so wrong for that movie. You had to drive on the freeway. You had to drive through the Hollywood Hills. You had to drive past Griffith Park. You had to drive through the valley. You had to drive on Ventura Boulevard. You had to drive in all those places and you had to see them driving on those streets. And you had to do it, you know, it, it, there are wonderful ways of doing these things now, especially at night. It was so much easier at night because there's less traffic. And we didn't have the money and we didn't have the time to light the night exteriors there. We had to actually find locations where all the backgrounds were already lit. They were lit by Department of Water and Power. There were all the sodium vapor lights in the backgrounds on the streets, in the various communities we shot. And all I had to do was light the foreground. All I had to do was blend the foreground actors into what already existed in the background. So finding those places and making the street lighting and the you know ambient lighting that exists in the city at night, whether it's from storefronts or just overhead lighting from billboards or the street lights themselves, make that part of the movie. It clearly presented itself as our only approach. And that really came out of, you know, it comes out of the script comes out of script and character, like all these things do. And, and in terms of, uh, what was the other film you mentioned? I can't remember. Well, there's Boogie Nights. Oh, Boogie Nights. Well, you know, that's that's Paul's love, Paul's love of the valley, the goddamn valley. You know, I grew up in the Where West. I am on right the now. West. I, I, I grew up Me on the too. west side of LA, in West Los Angeles. I went to Venice High. I went to Santa Monica High. I never went to the valley. Why would you go to the valley? There's nothing there. I mean, we didn't go to movies in the valley. Valley was deaf. Valley was this horrible, boring place where people had chicken farms. And, you know, there were these horrible houses and there was lots of apartment buildings. And there was one mm, sort of a movie theater, which is gone now, turned into a bookstore. I don't know. It was or a clothing store. I don't know what. And yeah, there was something there. I know the one. It's on a bookstore. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, sorry. So that was it. There was no reason to go there. And I never did. And it was really when I met Paul. And he sort of dragged me out to those places. And I never, what, what Paul was able to do, I think, and it, it certainly happened in Punch Drunk Love, but I think in all the films, he's able to kind of find, it's not that there's any charm there, but there's a kind of a uniqueness <laughs> and a quality. But no, but no. But I think I'm very charming. <laughs> well, but there's a, there's a part of it that conveys LA in a way that no other place does. Because it's, it's kind of flat and airless 
and there's nothing to look at, and it's banal, but there's interesting places. When we scouted on Magnolia and we went to all these places, it sort of opened my eyes to what was possible and what was there. Certainly with Boogie Nights, finding the, you know, the theater and finding the, you know, the, the old nightclub, which I'd actually been to when I was in college. It's across the street, all that stuff. That was interesting. But Magnolia was, look at all these interesting places. And you can actually, you get on Ventura Boulevard, you drive, you know, drive to all these places. And you look at them again at night, for the most part, they become interesting. And you can make them interesting just by how you light them, how you shoot them, just like that. But they really are unique. You kind of talked about growing up in L.A. and assuming immersed in and around the film business. I always want to know, what was the moment when it occurred to you that cinematography specifically was the path you were going to go down? You know, it was kind of strangely early. And I, I kind of explain it, except that when I was a kid, because it was so long ago, old movies played on TV all the time. It was mm -hmm. like TCM on every every network. All the movies, and initially, because we only had a black and white television, that's how long ago this was, were in black and white. And they showed lots of black and white films, and they showed them over and over and over again. I could see My Darling Clementine, and then watch an episode of Lawman, and I saw that there was an extraordinary difference, that I felt nothing. Watching Lawman was like watching storytelling. It was surveillance photography. I shouldn't say that. I'm picking on a DP who's probably passed away. But I would watch My Darling Clementine, and uh, I would realize that I felt differently. I felt something because of the way it looked. I was struck emotionally by the, sort of the design of the lighting and the graphic images in black and white, and how that affected, and not just that movie, but every movie. And I started see, paying attention to who it was who that credit said director of photography. And I grew up with my grandparents. My grandmother explained to me how these movies are made. And I once remember, I had a conversation with her about it. I think it was, uh, I can't remember the movie. It was probably Jane Eyre, I suppose. And I really thought they went to England. You know, I really thought they, all these places were, um, you know, they went to these exotic locations. And I remember my grandmother telling me very early on, you know, Robert, that was uh, a mile and a half from your 20th Century Fox. You drive your bike by it all the time. That's where they <laughs> and it was like dumbstruck. And it's like, you know, uh, over on uh, Overland Boulevard, when you see all those old buildings, it looks like a French village. That's MGM. Really? What? Is, yeah. I mean, it's like all of a sudden the, it was it was still romantic and mysterious to me. But it was astonishing to me that all this stuff was all shot and it was all created within like five miles of my house. And learning all of that and thinking about it, it had a huge impression on me as a kid. So anyway, that's a long story short. That's it. Robert, you've been extremely generous with your time here. And what I, I would kind of like to maybe wrap this up with is ask you, you know, you've got an incredibly diverse career. You've done all these different genres uh, of work. Is there something you haven't done that's on your, your bucket list? That's something that you that oh, you want to do? I, I have no idea. No, I, I can't even imagine. I don't know. I don't even, I don't even think of those terms. You know, the people I admire the most, I mean, we all grow up, if you're a cinematographer, you want to be a cinematographer, you always grow up like admiring certain people and you admire them for different reasons. And you think, oh my God, Serrano, look at the light. Look at the color. Look at the, the guy I always end up gravitating towards when I was younger, when I saw the movies when I was in school, Owen Roisman, who's mm -hmm. still with us. Mm -hmm. And Owen Roisman, there's Owen Roisman, right? He makes the greatest, I think the greatest American comedy in the last, whatever, I don't know, 50 years or whatever is Tootsie, right? The most honest, the most real, the most genuinely funny, and the most inspiring, the most real, the most honest American comedy that isn't just a straight comedy. It's a great film. Right. He does the great Sidney Lumet version of The Exorcist. Right. The greatest horror movie, the greatest cop film. I would say the greatest cop procedural French connection. Right. He does the great Sidney Lumet movie um, network. He, I mean, I could go through them all. They are all different. The Taking of Pelham 123. Now, I'm sure the people who made The Taking of Pelham 123, the remake, were Denzel's great, blah, 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 blah. There's Owen Roisman. Three Days of the Condor. You know, Sorry. <laughs> three of the yeah. Oh, I the mean, Adams I mean, family. You, yeah, no, you could. Oh, and 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 the one of the best westerns was it? Oh, what was it? It was like oh, wider. It was the one he did. Yeah, wider. yeah. He did Grand I mean, Canyon, which I think is an under-celebrated movie. Grand Canyon is a gorgeous. Film. It's great. 
It's great. And True Confessions, because nobody even knows that movie. Cool. And uh, I'm yeah. going to throw in I'm yeah. going to throw in one that I like just because yeah. I was Go. on the wrestling team, yeah. but Vision Quest. <laughs> Vision <laughs> Quest. Absolutely. Vision <laughs> Quest. And another film with Dustin Hoffman that nobody's seen that Ulla Grossbart, the great Ulla Grossbart directed, called Straight Time. And it should be noted too, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. <laughs> The, oh, yes. I don't remember. I didn't know he did that. <laughs> he pieces. did a musical. Yes. He's done everything. And, but Straight Time is an amazing look at LA. Straight Time, and, and Dustin Hoffman's extraordinary in it. And and you all gross for did an amazing. But Owen Roisman, he seems to always be serving the content. And he seems to always work with directors who are demanding in certain ways. And he's working his way through the movie in a way that I admire enormously. And what an extraordinary career. And I don't know how many Academy Award nominations he never won. Um, he's just my, uh, uh, he's just an amazing guy. And he retired early. I think he, he probably retired before he wanted to or needed to. But he's somebody I think about all the time in terms of like, wow, you had a career like that. The movies he did were truly extraordinary. He worked on and his contribution to them. The Exorcist still scares the shit out of me hmm. when I see that movie. And it's because of the way it's lit and designed. Anyway. So well, I think that that's that's a, a great place uh, for us to end. Uh, I, I feel <laughs> okay. I feel awful though because I wanted to talk to you about. I, I'd love to have you back on at some point. I want to yeah. talk to you about David Mamet. I'd love to talk to you more about your oh, Paul, yeah. Paul Anderson stuff. There, we, there's we so should, much. More. We should arrange a part two. We can do that whenever you would like. I know you're busy and you're working right now, but there's several people we've done part twos and even Wally Fister. I think was a part three. So you know, yeah. it's like Wally there's Fister. Oh, part four. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no I, we, I'm happy to do it. Yeah, I'd love to do a part two because, again, I, I just want to be mindful of you have a very early call and I don't want to keep you up any later than we already oh, have. I understand. That's fine. Before we go, is there a place that you like to interact with people online, Instagram or your own website? Or do you have... A... I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any online presence at all. I don't have Instagram. I don't have Facebook. I don't do anything at all. I'm one thing. That you have like 10 Sorry. more hours in every day than I do. So congratulations yeah. for that. Well, thank you so much for all your time. And we can't wait to have you back on oh, and, and talk about everything. And honestly, thank you for all the movies you've made. Uh, like... There are well, so, so many of them are like my favorite movies of all time. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Thank you. All right. It's, it's Take really care. true. Return to the Living Dead, part two. <laughs> Big time. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Robert. Hey, that was our fantastic interview with uh you know, here i am talking about how great our interview was but it was great to have that it was conversation our with interview Ellswood. with the great robert ellswood how's that he really was uh someone who we talked about from the beginning who we'd really like to have on the show oh for sure and it only took seven years but uh i'm glad that <laughs> i'm glad that it happened so. well hopefully it won't take another seven years to, to talk to him again because <laughs> even though he did obviously touch on paul thomas anderson and, and some of the other stuff it's like i want to do a deep dive into boogie nights and we never even really got to talk about like all his work with david mamet all his work with george clooney like he's just got so much there's so much more i want to ask him oh his, absolutely i love the way and i told him this that i, I don't feel like anyone photographs uh, los angeles like him he photographs real los angeles yeah. like it, oh, yeah. it 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 feels like the real place i live he's so brilliant here's some trivia i know we didn't get into it maybe we'll get into it next time do you know who his godson is? I would have no idea who his godson is. It's Jake Gyllenhaal. Whoa! <laughs> I know, so it's just like, you know, it's just it's just like one of those random things. It's kind of like one of those L.A. things. It's like, oh, all yeah, right, and yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal's your godson. Okay, great. So, Fair anyway. Enough. And now, short ends. So, Ben, it is that time. That time again. That time you and I have been discussing before ever getting on these mics. Short ends. What is your short end? this week mine is is kind of sad uh bittersweet i guess and it's the passing of writer Anne rice novelist Anne Anne rice oh. and uh i have to say that Anne rice lover or hater her work was some of the most influential stuff and i would say that a lot of the work that i've been lucky enough to be part of things like the blair witch project for my part of what i was working on it was very informed by her creating what i would say was kind of a, a very in-world universe with the Vampire Chronicles. And I read, uh, I, I remember I, I was a teenager in the 80s and my father took me to the gym and the woman behind the desk as they checked you in was reading a book called The Vampire Lestat. And I'm like, what's that? And she was like, <laughs> it's really good. And I went out and got that book and just tore through it. Then I went back and read Interview with the Vampire. And what I thought was brilliant about those books, 
especially those two, was that they are true first person narratives that kind of contain the world and contain the idea of point of view and they never violate the point of view that they set up. And not only that, I mean, they're just really well written. And I feel like she informed a whole universe of uh, storytellers and filmmakers and uh, not that vampires weren't already, uh, you know, gothic sex figures, but she steered so hard into that. I mean, like part of her life, she was basically a writer of uh, let's call it erotica under a pseudonym. And, uh, you know, there weren't that that many movies made of her work, although Interview with the Vampire, directed by Neil Jordan, is, I think, a noteworthy film, you know, starring Brad Pitt in one of his, you know, when we were still all trying to get to know Brad Pitt, him and Tom Cruise, who everyone was... It, it launched Kirsten Dunst's career, too. Yeah, Chris, Kirsten Dunst was, I think, 14 when she made that movie. She might have been younger. Yeah, that movie is like a murderer's row of amazing 90s actors, looks beautiful, is really well made. Then there are lesser appreciated movies like uh, Exit Eden, which I think was directed by Gary Marshall and had uh, Dan Aykroyd and Rosie O'Donnell in the leads. Uh, there was a Queen of the Damned movie that came out uh, yeah. in like, I think it was like 2003. Anyway, she's not as well known in the, in the movie circles, but I think she was very influential as a, a writer of horror in terms of uh, legitimizing horror, not that it needs to be legitimized in my opinion, but I feel like she kind of brought horror to an audience that maybe wouldn't have gravitated to a Stephen King or a Clive Barker. And she was extremely prolific and she hit a lot of different subgenres within horror. I found out even today because I have the Facebook group Needs a Werewolf. Yes, she wrote a <laughs> werewolf book. <laughs> So anyway, I'm so glad you worked you worked that in there. I, I did. No, no, I'm, I'm definitely going to be plugging my needs a werewolf group. Anyway, but uh, rest in peace, Anne Rice. Definitely check out her work if you haven't. I I can't recommend Interview with the Vampire and the Vampire Lestat highly enough. If you're a reading type, I know we're a cinematography podcast, but a lot of great movies come from books, and she wrote a lot of them. So. I remember I was a junior in high school when I read uh, Interview with a Vampire, and uh, I had to read it for, well, I didn't have to read it, but I chose to read it for an English class, oh. and I remember it being somewhat controversial at the time. Like, you know, the school wasn't sure that this was going to be okay, and I remember having to talk to someone and getting them to, like, sign off on it, or I, I don't remember, it was like, it was some sort of deal. I mean, I, I don't I don't remember what it was that they objected to, but it was probably all the, the sex that's in there, yeah. I have a crazy similar story in that when I was in the 12th grade, I did a research paper comparing Anne Rice to Bram Stoker. Mm. And, you know, because Anne Rice at that point was relatively recent, there weren't like scholarly books written about her writing yet. You, there were tons of articles, but my teacher allowed me to use a quote from Playboy magazine. I was very excited. Oh, wow. Not that I, <laughs> that it, it, it was like pulled from a reader's guide or something like, it's not like I, I had a Playboy magazine, but I thought like, I felt like I was getting away with something in that in a research paper, I was allowed to cite uh, a magazine, which also contained uh, naked boobs. <laughs> Yes, yes, that's true. But uh, I think people forget that uh, Playboy was actually known for journalism once upon a time. So, yeah, I know. I, I mean, the joke is that, uh, you know, oh, I only read it for the articles. But actually, <laughs> yeah, exactly. They, they had some pretty good writers writing for Playboy. Oh, once upon a time. Yes. Uh, so, Ilya, uh, what is your short end this week? Uh, my short end is uh, and, and I'm looking very forward to going to watch my short end after we're done speaking here. It's the show Succession. Uh, succession on HBO. I've gone all the way through it now. I'm I'm up to the, it's the season finale for uh, the third season, and it's a really really wonderful show that is somewhat improvised and is has it somewhat improvised. It is. I, I, I've heard that. I but, I, I feel like that writing is just tight as a drum. I can't. I, that's the most shocking thing I've heard all day. Yeah. I there was just a there was just an expose that came out about it, and uh, some people are calling it a hit piece and stuff like that too. But one of the revelations is is that quite a bit of that dialogue. There, there's a lot of rehearsals, but a lot of the stuff that that goes into it, it sounds like they're there. It's improvised. It's really, really improvised. Wow, I feel like that. The, it's so well written. It, it just, I'm just shocked. Sorry, go on. I agree. It's it feels really tight. It doesn't feel like an improvised. It doesn't. It certainly doesn't feel like a Judd Apatow sort of like you know improvisation sort of like comedy thing. But this is 
no mistake a comedy. Or even as much as I love Curb Your Enthusiasm, it, do, it doesn't feel like Curb Your Enthusiasm. It doesn't feel like Curb Your Enthusiasm. It doesn't feel like that. It feels tight and together. And I don't know. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think the arc of the show is probably very, very well set. But it feels to me like perhaps that some of the more biting comments and some of that sort of stuff is probably worked out maybe on the day, which is which is fascinating. But also, I guess I'm not totally surprised because it is uh, Will Ferrell and Adam McKay are like executive producers on this show. So it's like and you don't necessarily think I think of a show like this as being a Will Ferrell, Adam McKay show at all. But, uh, you know, they did the big short, so might as well. And Brian Cox, who's the lead in the show, is just freaking great. It's like it's it's all the casting is, yeah. is pitch perfect. It's, it's, it's so it's, well cast. It's really good. So uh, I got to say that uh, I know a lot of people who say like, oh, I don't really want to see something that is uh, dark and mean spirited. And there is certainly some darkness and some mean spirited. But as the more that I'm watching it, the more I'm convinced it's a comedy and I'm finding the comedy everywhere through this thing. And uh, if you have avoided it or thought, yeah, this isn't really for me, I think it's worth giving a shot. I definitely think it's worth giving it a fair shot as much as any other program out there that you would consider watching it's worth watching. It's it's a tour de force performances, and it feels like something out of Mammoth. Even the episodes that I would say are probably their lesser episodes, still there's high quality redeeming aspects that I look forward to. It's worth just watching. It's worth watching and and seeking out the humor because the humor is really there. And uh, I think that for those who have dark sensibilities, maybe that's me, a dark sense of humor, uh, you, you might really, really enjoy the show. Yeah, I'm right there with you. And actually, I, I feel like I'm the person you're describing because when I saw the promos for it, I was like, eh, yeah, why, why do really I want to watch like my that? Thing. Yeah. And, and, and my wife, Alicia, was watching it and convinced me to check it out. And I was like, oh, this is like shocking good. Like it's it's really well done. And also, I should say, beautiful to look at, like just really beautifully photographed. And it's photographed sort of in a, I won't say documentary style at all, but there's like glamour and verte somehow had a child and and it's got <laughs> sort of a, a verte vibe for it and i have to say also some of the actors in it like karen culkin or mm. alan ruck who yeah. are always good but like no, you know they're real, like, next level yeah next level i've never seen alan ruck I, i've never seen him put in a bad performance but i've never seen him play a character like this and it's it's so amazing to see kind of all these people kind of stretch their legs and be willing to kind of play odious terrible people i feel like at its core it's kind of telling us that rich people are just as miserable as everybody else <laughs> uh i i think that it, it's really true that you watch the show and you're like an episode might end and you're like why am i rooting for anybody right now <laughs> who, who are these yeah. people why am i given a reason to keep going with this and I kind of feel like it's not hate watching, but you hate some of the characters so much you want to see them get their just desserts. You want to see a, a come up and sap and you want it's to see It's a little bit like billions if you weren't supposed to like anyone. Mm. A a constant complaint that you'll get from executives and stuff is that, you know, these characters aren't likable. And it's a good reminder that, you know, there are shows like Breaking Bad, obviously. But you can take characters who aren't likable and as long as they're very compelling you'll still get invested in finding out what happens to them. It, you don't have to like them. You don't want to have to drink a beer with these people. And I don't. No, I, I think it's kind of wonderful that there's like seven antiheroes. It's yeah. like every single one of them is is at various levels of corruption, various levels of, of, of and they of all And they all know that about themselves. They do. And they're all... And they're they're all, all they've all made of, their peace with it, too. Yeah. Just like... <laughs> it's a great show. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, as soon as we're done here, I was about halfway through this week's succession when we started. Ah. And um, and, uh, as soon as we're done here, I'll go finish uh, the I didn't realize it was the finale. Yeah. OK. So I will say that last week left ended on quite a cliffhanger. So it sure did. Yeah. I can't yeah. I can't wait. All right. Well, uh, I won't well, spoil it for you. Well, no, let's wrap this this sucker up then. Let's get to it so I can go All watch right, it. So. it. <laughs> hey, uh, Ben, where can people find you if they, they want to find you online? Well, I keep telling people, and so, and several of you have listened, I'm at Needs a Werewolf on uh, Facebook. <laughs> so if you're on Facebook, there's a group called Needs a Werewolf, and uh, in it, we're just pitching ways to improve all of <laughs> movies, literature, music, you name it, by adding a werewolf into it, and it's uh, it's it's really taken off. So like the television series MASH needs a werewolf. Well, yeah, and that's, and that's a, a fine pitch, but I would love to know who's the werewolf. <laughs> 
<laughs> is it Klinger? <laughs> of course it's Klinger. It's too obvious if, if it's Hawkeye. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is it Trapper John? Um, oh my God. Yeah, it's like, and how, like, how does the werewolf We just lost every themselves? millennial listening to us right now. They have no idea what we're talking about. That's true. About. That's true. true. And Gen Z. Well, Gen Z was Gen Z is not, yeah. It's, Gen Zs are like podcasts. Those are for old people. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, um, <laughs> outside of that, please go to benrockonline.com. You can check out my real and you can listen to Video Palace. I've got links to that. I've got all kinds of stuff. Check it out. You can uh, uh, find all my social media connections there. And, you know, find me on Twitter. Find me on LinkedIn. Whatever. How about yourself, Ilya? Where can people find you? Uh, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras. HotRodCameras.com is the website. Sponsor of the show. I'm doing all kinds of really interesting stuff. Basically, for the rest of the month, we're remodeling. So, uh, Whoa. Yeah, I know. It's been... Uh, yeah, and and your good friend Josh is coming out to uh, do, to help with that project a bit, and uh, we're putting in new shelves. Josh Ben, yeah. amazing carpenter, brilliant yeah, guy. Yeah, he's he's building me some custom shelves, and we're doing all kinds of stuff. So it's like, uh, yeah, it, I keep thinking like, oh, we're almost done, but no, it just like uh, you know uh, keeps revealing more more work to be done. So yeah, we you know what you guys could use? What's that? A werewolf. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, you know what one of my employees kind of a werewolf so there you go it's good to know you should yeah. let me know who it is and i'll avoid them on the full moon uh his name's dylan so yeah okay kind of the world okay you can avoid I, them, i've so. got my eyes on you dylan <laughs> i got my my silver bullets ready uh okay so ben who should we thank this week uh, well, let's first off start with Alana Cody, who's kicking all the ass and getting us amazing interviews like the one you just listened to. Holy crap. I don't think our listeners know exactly how much we were crapping our pants when we found out that we were going to get to talk to him. Oh, speaking of kicking all the ass, I happen to know that Alana signed up for karate now. So she oh, is no. li- literally kicking the ass while she is kicking the ass. So there you go. That's terrifying. I know. Isn't that? Uh, we should also thank Ben Katz, our awesome, amazing editor, who hopefully this week we didn't make a terrible mess for him, but he always manages to make us not sound like incredible morons that we are. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for, for doing that. Thank you, Ben. You're an amazing editor. And lastly, and never leastly, Kaze Alatrakshi, who uh, created every scrap of music that you heard in this episode. You can find him at musicbykaze.com. I think I think Kaze could also use a werewolf. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think you're setting yourself up for uh, receiving lots of werewolves this year for for Christmas, Ben. I, I I'm down. <laughs> I definitely need more werewolf, so uh, it's not a problem for me. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's just going to do it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Listening.